Good afternoon and welcome to the East Hampton Library to today's author talk presentation. Today we have with us Josh Sapin, who is going to talk about his new book, The Third Act. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Josh. Thanks so much, Steve. I hope this sound is okay here and the sounds okay on Zoom and the sound will be okay later on the library's YouTube channel. And I'll just start by saying that it's a, a treat <clears throat> for me to be here and thank you guys coming out for coming out on Saturday at 1 p.m. when you could be napping or walking in the sun or eating lunch or watching, uh, for those of you who are fans, and uh, basketball. I don't know what you're fans of, but there are many other things that seem pretty desirable to me. So uh, I'm very pleased and I'm grateful that you're here. Thanks so much. And, and thanks to Steve for uh, allowing me to be here and for the beautiful library, which is, I just think it's exquisite. And he told me that they expanded it in 2014 and some libraries look, don't look so pretty after an expansion. And I think this one looks just gor gorgeous and beautiful and lovely. So it's a pleasure to be here. So I came here because I wrote this book about a sort of what you do after you do what you do. And, um, that's an attempt at glib way of saying that I worked in the media business for 48 years. I was uh, the CEO of AMC Networks for 25. And as I was approaching stopping the end of that retirement, I thought, oh no, what will I do? So I'll offer a caveat, which is that I'm not a gerontologist or an expert on the subject. I just thought about what I might do and became interested in what others did and how they lived their lives and what they did when they transitioned. And I'm gonna guess that, just guess that each of you has had chapters in your life and may have ambitions and desires that are unrealized. And, um, and it, it's, a, it's a curiosity of mine to see how people engage with those things. What, what they do about them, not that there's virtue in obsessive action, which might be my predisposition, but that it's just a curiosity how people live their lives and how they make transitions and what they realize. So I'm not gonna take you through the book because we have a special guest who I'd like to ask questions of and she'll join in a moment, but you'll see on the book cover a few well-known faces and some unknown faces. And I'm gonna just mention a couple of the well-known ones because they're fun and inspiring. Um, uh, Gloria Steinem is there and George Takai is on the lower left. And George, uh, I had the privilege of working on a show with George and his husband, Brad, and he's now doing a, a performance in London and has a monster social following and went from being, I know him as Sulu, and, but, but Sulu's far behind and he's truly a social activist and is having extraordinary impact. And Alan Alda, who's local, has a place out here. I got to know a bit and just two seconds on him because it's sort of remarkable. I know him as Hawkeye in MASH. And then I know him as doing a, a couple of plays, one on television less well-known as he did uh, a science show on PBS for eight years out of his deep interest. And then he opened the Alda Center for Communications because he was of the opinion that particularly physicians didn't communicate well with patients. And he trained no fewer than 5,000 doctors in how to talk better. And uh, you know, I, uh, I can certainly relate to that when a doctor says, blah, 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 take the pill. And um, I often wonder what it is. So he devoted himself to that, quite a multi-hyphenate guy. And then so many other people are in the book, it's hard to go through them all. There's 50 people who are unknown. There's a woman, Donzella Washington, who decided she didn't have a college degree and she decided to get one and became the oldest graduate of A&M University at age 80 uh, with a 4.0 grade average. There's a woman who, was in a fire as a kid, had a career and said, I wanna be a firefighter, I always wanted to. And at age 62, became a firefighter. And a guy who was a telephone repairman and he loved design and he became a shoe designer after his career as a uh, telephone repairman. 
and, and abundant stories, a guy named Carl Butts who lost his wife and they were ready to retire and move into the sunset. And he was lonely and a little bereft and he purchased the smallest circulation newspaper in America and became uh, William Randolph Hearst of a circulation of 300. Uh, so there's just these wonderful stories that I found sort of enchanting and many with filled with social impact, including a woman named Hope Harley, who worked at Verizon corporate gig and grew up in Brooklyn and went to the Brooklyn Children's Museum, but worked in the Bronx and felt that the Bronx borough needed a children's museum. And she worked on it for years and years and opened it in a bus. And then finally, it was in the New York Times a couple of months ago, opened the Bronx Children's Museum. So there are these just remarkable people who are doing remarkable things. And so uh, it, it got me interested and hence the book. Um, so the special guest I have is someone uh, who um, I've known for a very long time. And she's too young, I think, to have a bona fide third act. I know her chronological age. Uh, and she, should, she's not, she shouldn't be in the same sphere with me. She's too young. So we can call her being in her second act. Um, but it's a fascinating second act because Margaret Garrett, who will join me in a moment, uh, <clears throat> is from the Midwest. And I went to college in the Midwest. But to New Yorkers, I will say the New Midwest. And friend Patrick Montgomery is here, too, from Cincinnati, Ohio. I'll tell you, for some reason, the Midwest always seems wildly exotic to me. And if you work in the entertainment business, even more exotic because you commute from New York to LA. And so when someone grew up with those spaces, I always think, my God, what is that like? Um, and so she has an interesting trajectory of her life. And um, because her dad was an academic and she didn't go to college. So uh, I'm going to ask Margaret to come up and ask her about what she does, but I'll just say three things first. She is an acclaimed artist, painter now, and her work's been just locally in Guildhall, Parish Art Museum, Southampton Arts Center. She's about to do an installation overseas um, and has been represented by many of New York's finest galleries and um, is also doing a program right now uh, at the church, which she can tell you about in Sag Harbor. And that relates to what she did before she was a painter. So Margaret, come on and join me if you would. So there's Margaret Garrett. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. <laughs> I guess we can sit. So I'm, I'm just gonna ask you, Margaret, um, I'm gonna start with what you do now and then go backwards if I may. Uh, so your work, is today, as I said, locally, it's been in Guildhall, it's been in the parish, Southampton, and you curated a show at the Shelter Island Historical Society. Can I just ask you about that first? Because it was a great art show last year at the, the Shelter, Shelter Island Historical Society. It was actually my first real curation thing that I did, um, but the, that building has been redone and they have a beautiful place for um, exhibitions. And on Shelter Island, we have a tradition of amazing artists. You know, John Chamberlain lived and worked there and Alan Shields, and there's several that are current. And so I, I did a small group show of about eight artists who had or do live and work on Shelter Island and installed it in the space. And it was up for the whole summer and we did a series of talks around it and it was quite exciting. It was actually beautiful. It was really quite <laughs> remarkable too. To. And so do you mind talking about, and then we'll go backwards after we establish what you're up to today, okay. if you don't mind. Okay. So, so the, the um, can you mention what you're doing at the church in Sag Harbor? Right. So, well, so for the, you know, the bunch, bunch of the last years, I've been mostly making paintings. My work is abstract. Um, it involves movement and rhythm and things like that. And then about um, five years ago, I actually started to dance again. Um, initially to try to find um, uh, shapes that I might want to use in my artwork. And in the course of doing that, I started to film myself and I realized there was something there. So I started to create um, videos, which you might see some clips of, that use dance, but also patterns. Um, and so I've been doing this for a bunch of years. And so it's really brought the dance back and the dance and the painting and the visual art are very entwined now. 
And in the summer, I had, um, I was asked to be part of something at Guildhall that was on the beach. And I ended up, you had to create something there. And I was like, what am I going to do? So I thought, well, I'll do a happening. So I created a, a dance for whoever was there, a group dance. And it was so um, rewarding and people really responded it, to it well. And I sort of realized that that's something that people don't get to do. They don't get to come together and dance together or learn choreography or be part of an art thing. So I ended up doing this project at the church where I was a resident there for about three weeks and I created four group dances um, and I did four work workshops. People signed up, they came in the workshop, we got moving, I taught them these dances, they did them and we filmed them and they were based on four elements, um, earth, fire, air and water. And then I had set up my paper and my video equipment. So I filmed everybody individually. So I'm working on a, a video that will involve everybody who participated. And then from this work, I also um, was doing paintings based on scores, based on movement. And so it's a real multidisciplinary project. So you, you, I didn't explain adequately when you mentioned back to dance. Can you just describe uh, you were a teenager in the Midwest and then Pennsylvania, not really the Midwest, but <laughs> to us, to us, that's the Midwest. I well, think it's far enough west. Both parents from Chicago, so <laughs> okay. they are fine with that. Um, yeah. So I let me start. Grow, yeah. So I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania, which happened to have the best um, ballet teacher one of, in the country. One of them. I mean, the current head of New York City Ballet trained there as well. And um, so I started dancing when I was young and it was a very serious school and I became a dancer. So my childhood was about that. I left home at 16 and joined Pennsylvania Ballet and um, danced there. And then I went on to Cleveland Ballet and then I moved to New York and did some freelancing and different things. But it was in my like early twenties that I kind of burnt out on the whole dance thing because I think I'd done it so intensely, so young and so spent my 20s trying different things and found my way to artwork. Yeah, so I just I just have to mention, uh, I can't resist it, tawdry as it may be, in the hallowed halls of a library, your brush with well-known dancers in, in New York is always fun to listen to. Bob Fosse. Oh, oh yeah, so yeah, well, I, I, I happened to, when at Cleveland Ballet, I became good friends with um, Nicole Fosse and I ended up spending the summer living with them, which was very exciting. And my my intro, I had no idea about really musical theater before then because <laughs> I was such a ballet nerd. And so that was a real turn on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, so it's sort of interesting. I don't know what you do for a living. I'm going to just attempt to relate it to you for a moment, um, if I can, with only a rhetorical question, but maybe we can speak afterwards, because there's a bit of an organic transition from being a dancer to the artwork that you did now, think, particularly. Now, particularly, and even I think, you know, I mean, I've always said like in my artwork, I sort of see the, the painting as a stage. I, I kind of, I understand spatial awareness. I think there is a real relationship between those things, you know, yeah. and certainly choreography is, it was an extension of being a dancer. And so what I'm doing now, both with the choreographic dances, um, and even the video work, yeah, it all kind of does relate in a way. But it was, it is interesting too, because when I first became a visual artist, I really had to, that was in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And um, in order to be taken seriously in another profession, you had to say, that's a, what I did. Like people would say, oh, you're a dancer. Like, no, no, I used to, not anymore. And that's really changed. So. And when I did start to dance and bring it back in, it was like, okay to do so. Like now the whole idea of being multidisciplinary is fine yeah. and actually interesting. Yeah. And so that's sort of a change culturally that has enabled me to embrace my past. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to ask one question about left brain, right brain, because um, just worthy of hearing that you're also a mom of two lovely daughters, but also you're not only doing art, you're also the board, if not the chair of the school. I was when, were, they, yeah. when they were little. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the chair of the board of schools. So it's, so it just, it's along the way, you weren't only thinking about forms, shape, 
you were also the chair of the board of a school. So it, <laughs> it, it does mean that you're dealing with different parts of your brain when you do with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think also as an artist, you are, you are a small business. And so you're handling that too, you know, so it's a lot of, yeah. Good. Hey, so can we, are we able to get on the screen because it's, it's hard, it's easy to talk about people like Norman Lear, um, uh, but harder to uh, appreciate art without seeing some part of it. So we'll see if the electronics agree with us. Uh, while they're doing that, I'll just mention that I was on a Zoom call with Norman Lear uh, the day before yesterday uh, because I'm involved in a political organization that he founded and um, he turned 100 recently. Uh, we're pro probably all aware of him, but uh, we were talking about the organization's fundraising and he said on the Zoom, we were having a meeting in Washington, DC. Well, you know, I'm turning 101. Uh, the next birthday's coming up. So why don't we use that to try to help raise money? And here's this guy who's, we just did, just did the big hundred thing. And then he said, you know, I did fly 44 missions. I just found this a wild anecdote. I'll finish the anecdote, forgive me. He said, I did fly 44 missions in World War II accompanied by Tuskegee airmen who were flying oh. interference for him. Oh. And he said, so I think for my 101st, one of those people still alive, one of the Tuskegee airmen, and maybe we can take Norman Lear and a Tuskegee airman to celebrate my 101st and use it for good social purpose. And I sort of, my jaw sort of dropped <laughs> because I thought, you know, I scream when I get out of bed in the morning. Um, and here he is at 101 volunteering to do all that stuff. So anyway, that was my interlude while we transitioned to tech. Thank you, Steve. But let's go back to the painting. And OK, so this is a, a fairly recent painting. It's a large acrylic. It's called I Wish the Sky Would Rain Down Roses, which is a line from a poem. Um, you can see, I mean, there is always movement in my paintings. That's still a current thing. This is a painting. This is, by the way, a sight to behold in person. I've seen it, and it's just breathtaking. <laughs> is it possible to turn, over the, turn off these lights? Or That'd be yeah. great, because yeah. actually this is a sight to behold. I can't say enough about it. I've actually seen it, and it's beautiful and overwhelming. Um, this is a painting called Nocturnal. There, that's better. Thank you, Steve. Um, and it, it's also an acrylic on linen. Um, and I actually included this. My, I'm married to a composer. Bruce Wolosoff, and he has a suite of piano pieces called Night Paintings that he just played in New York City on Thursday night. And this is one of them, which is a real honor. So um, yeah, there's beautiful. actually now just music beautiful. to go with this painting, yeah, that's so, it's so which is beautiful. very cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's <laughs> large. It's uh, 43 by 61, so it's about four by, by 50. There's a sister of this painting called um, Journal, um, which is in the collection at the Parish Museum. This is called American Rhythm, and it's a very large painting. It's like over seven feet wide. Um, again, I often work with layers and a lot of um, rhythm and motion and um, counterpoint. All those kind of musical things end up being sort of how I compose. This is a new piece, which I actually did at the church. It's called Composition One. So I made scores of these dances, and then I've been using the scores. Um, Sorry, when you say scores, that means? I means I actually, so I created dances and I realized there isn't, there is Le Bon, but there's not really a real way people write down dance. Usually yeah. it's sort of taught and videotaped, but I was making them and I ha had to remember them. So I kind of created my own language and I started to realize that was an intriguing artwork in itself. I don't have one of the scores. So, it's a, so I'm going to put it in really lay terms. So that's sort of, it's a, it's a, it, it's not the steps to the dance. It's the. Well, sometimes there's shapes that'll say like, I'll have a little triangle and it'll say four that way, turn, you know, just so like notes to, to myself, but then also it does end up being, it's like a language. So it's, I'm very intrigued by languages, asymmetric, asymmetric language where you don't really understand, but it's intriguing anyhow. Um, asymmetric is that the word? Asymmetric. What yeah. That, what does that mean? It, it means, just means you intuitively feel it. It means you, it doesn't really have exact meaning, but it's there's a whole poetry. Yeah, you would find that interesting. There's a whole poetry line of this stuff. But so anyhow, what I, I took, thought what I thought you were going to say. I hope this doesn't sound like cheap humor. But I, <laughs> I thought what you were going to say is that certain languages, even if you don't understand the words, 
you can feel what it means. I find that particularly true, at least for me, having grown up with Yiddish in the household. Mm -hmm. When I hear Yiddish, even though I, my grandmother insisted on speaking Yiddish to me, I didn't know what on earth she was talking about, but I knew what she was talking about. Yeah. Because the language seemed to somehow just. Well, convey. I think it does. I mean, I think it means something to you. Like you look at some of these poems and you just, there's some feeling you get from it. And there are artists that do it. And I like, I like <clears> to play with it. But so I, from the scores, I would have certain motions and I would start, start those. So I'm sort of working on a series. So this is, it's a painting on paper. And this is a large um, vertical painting and it's called Harmonics. Um, it was actually in the exhibition at the um, beautiful Historical Gorgeous. Society. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, again, I play a lot with, you know, layers and rhythm. So it's the rhythm of that blue against the rhythm of the um, deeper orange that comes out and how that kind of plays in my mind musically. Mm. This is a new piece, um, new series that I'm doing and it also started from some of these dances. Um, it's yet to be titled. <laughs> and this is another one in that series. Um, loosely playing with the elements which I was working on with the dances. And then this is a, um, a woodblock print uh, called Duo. I did a whole show that was um, inspired by 19 poses that the Martha Graham Dance Company put out to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. So I used these poses um, and I I did a video, which you'll see a little clip of, and then I created other pieces around. I created a whole piece with the 19 poses and 19 collages, and then I did a suite of woodblock prints, and this is the one that's called Duo, and the entire suite is now in the collection of the Blanton Museum in wow. Texas. Fantastic. <laughs> so if we go to, do you mind if I show? I'd love yeah. to see them, yeah. yeah. So the next ones will be arguably a little more literal. Is that a fair thing to say? Uh, the videos yeah well the videos are uh, let's do actually let's do the 19 clip which is the third <clears> one first it's silent so i so <laughs> um so this is a clip from this video which in it i'm actually moving through all 19 poses and then sometimes when one is frozen that's one of the poses and it begins and ends with a tableau of the 19. Um, and it's silent, it plays on the loop. It's actually in an exhibition right now at the Southampton Art Center. If anyone's over there, you can see it. Oh, is that right? It's up there right now. It's up there right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so cool. Yep. So this is an example of what I was starting to do as I was playing with um, movement and filming. And they're all, they're just like another form of collage actually. So then we can go to um, freeze. I'm going to mention, oh, go, here we go. Yeah. So this was an earlier one I did. I was really um, interested. I've always loved those like lines of um, characters like yeah. oh yeah 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 Italy you know yeah <laughs> so I got sort of interested in that and the and again when I had started this it was about the body shapes and how I can find shapes that I can use in my artwork you know, these are actually <laughs> for me they're just great to see on a screen right here yeah no they're I mean, I mean, they're beautiful to thank see on you a big screen. yeah they're meant to be shown on large screens yeah. they're not really yeah they're not really meant to just be seen on your phone or your computer um yeah so this one was really a collage of like creating these shapes and creating these, this frame. And then, um, and then I did this sort of simple um, choreography and then it's, it kind of comes in, um, here it goes, yeah. And then there's just, I just brought one more clip which is one called In My World, um, that one, does actually have some music with it.
Wonderful. Thank you. Do I hear you said? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Margaret? Anything that anyone wants to say? Well, then I'm going to ask you something, if you don't mind, which is the um, when your art and, and I find this it's it's a it's somewhat an analog, I think, to whatever anyone does, whatever you do in your life for work, and whether you pick up an element of it later or not uh, in what you do next. If you've had done this for a job, that for a job, this for a job, um, does it ever reappear? You know, do you ever reconnect back to what you did or wanted to do earlier? In your case, it's very clear that you were a dancer and you were a painter, visual artist, and then the dance came into the painting. Oh yeah, obviously. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I had actually, when I was first left the ballet company, <clears throat> one of my gigs was choreographing for an off off Broadway theater for actors who didn't really move. And I actually really liked that. I, I wasn't really interested in like trying to come up with tricky steps, but I always found fun and choreography was the patterns. And so that has circled back to this current thing. So yeah, I, I think it's really interesting, you know, the way everything you do is what makes you who you are. So there's a woman here, if I can call, if I can call on you at, at risk of being surprising, I hope it's okay. So you've worked in the media business for all of your life now at lifetime right and uh there's a microphone and and how did you come to that i think um it first started with my father being a printer so graphic arts was sort of like a direction that i was exposed to and art was something that um i, I kind of leaned into I wasn't really good at math or anything but i was really good and um, I love television, and I fell into this new company that was called Home Box Office, and they only had boxing on it at the time. And um, it started to grow, and I was at HBO during a time where The Sopranos and Sex in the City, all of that just exploded. And um, I've been in the media business. I'm right now. I'm creative director at Lifetime. But um, I found this lecture interesting because I'm about to turn 65. And uh, so, what I, are you thinking? May I ask? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm thinking maybe a few more years <clears throat> of working because I still have a strong passion for, you know, creating all of the movie posters and the stuff and social. I don't know. I was I was really interested in hearing. So your stories and I have a lot of interests, but I I really don't know what my next step is. It's yeah. a bit scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe we do the same thing, and I, I, that's what motivated me. I sort of thought, what now? I won't wake up and have it all come at me. Um, that will be disorienting. Do you mind if I call on somebody else if I can, Gerilyn? Did you mind? Because um, there's a woman here. I happen to know that you were. I don't know what the proper term is for the type of baking that you did, but it, pastry, I mean, but it's more than pastry chef. It was a super high, high, highest end of yes. pastry chef, right? I worked at Lespinaz, now no longer. Right, but it was the sort of the finest pastry chef done at, in the world. Right. But that was after I was in the fashion business. Right. Right. Yeah. So how did so so how so what about that? Was there some relationship? I'm from Oregon, and I wasn't neurotic enough to be in the New York City Chanel. <laughs> yeah. So I went to cooking school. Oh really? Oh, so you really just said boom? Well, yeah. Now she's making very cool collage pieces that kind of you know go back to your fashion work in a way yeah so there's there it is again you know that circle all related yeah yeah it's so much fun yeah now here's my husband now patrick who has a very interesting story also yeah here we go do you mind patrick no i guess not <laughs> <laughs> you can um, choose to say i came as a, an audience member <laughs> 
I came as an audience member, and all of a sudden I have a <laughs> hand. So um, I was uh, I uh, started off restoring silent films. I worked for a small company and. Documentary filmmaker, documentaries from old enough to remember it. It was forty years ago, <laughs> um, and then I I decided um, side of the business. So I started archive. Five years ago, there was a kind of a, a consolidation in that business, and I sold, hired, um, bought a house on Shelter Island, and you know. Um, but you didn't really retire. Actually. I didn't really retire. Do you mind, no. So do you mind talking about that, Patrick? Because you seemed like you retired after you sold the company, but you really didn't retire. Well, and if, if retiring means not having a job. Then I retired, but I continued to do what I do, which is hold photographic collections and sell them. And, and I put together a big collection of 19th century Caribbean photographs. I sold to the Art Gallery of Ontario three years ago. And now I have a collection about the history of photography, which has a thousand objects in it. And And I have to mention when Patrick was trying to get a little exercise between those things, he walked from New York City to Shelter Island. And from New York City to Philadelphia. New York City to Philadelphia. So those are long walks. I, it gave me a chance to think about <laughs> <the> next. <laughs> Actually, I want to ask. What do you see as? Yeah, um, I, uh, you know, as you described, I really did it with, uh, I started to think about it five years ago, I'm 72. And I started to think, oh no, I'm 48 years of you sort of wake up, open the, the office door and it comes at you. Uh, you don't have to initiate it, it just comes at you. And I was the CEO of it for 25 years. So I became accustomed to that sort of thing and we became a public company so i you know i actually really in the book i tried to take the the i guess the best of what i thought was applicable for me people that i read about and encountered and uh to use a word that everyone uses now it's been a little iterative it's only been officially three months but i stopped being the ceo in a year and a half ago so so I have the good fortune of I have a little deal to make indie films for the company that I used to run and about to have a TV deal. So it's sort of same stuff. Uh, arguably, the more interesting things are uh, I, I really I, this guy was retiring when I was. You may even know him. He runs Cox Communications, Pat Esser. And we went out for coffee and he said, I'm not going to be one of these guys who does a life plan. You know, I'm not one of those guys. And he'd worked at this company for 44 years and all this stuff. And he has seven grandchildren. I thought, what's a life plan? He, what's that? He said, well, you know, they write across the top what's important to you. And then you put down the bubbles of when you're going to do this stuff. And I thought, I'm going to do that. So I did it in an attempt because I have at least the physical capability and the means to have discretion. And so I put down the things I wanted to do. And I, uh, one of them, it's going to sound really modest, was to do things that were somewhat unfamiliar that attempted to help the world a little bit, um, not up here, but sort of immediately. So we have a place in Shelter Island. I knocked on the door of the police department and said, can I volunteer? And they said, what can you do? And I sort of said nothing. And they said, uh, well, there's, uh, can you drive? I said, yeah. Did I tell you this ever? And so they said, well, you can drive the ambulance. And I said, whoa, that sounds cool. <laughs> I'm serious. Cool to do and also cool to talk about. I thought I could dine off it. I'm driving the ambulance now. And um, so they said, so, okay, let's so they do the physical. I did the physical. I passed that and all the stuff. Then they said, start the training. 
And I said, good. And so I went and met a young guy there and he put, and I got behind the wheel of the ambulance and we did a couple of sessions behind the wheel of the ambulance. And I thought, you know, this will be, I guess, useful. And also I've nothing like anything I've ever done. And so during the training, I said, how am I doing? And he said, you're driving really pretty well. And then he said, so um, I'm not too technologically comfortable. I mean, I can drive a car, but I wouldn't want to do what Steve just did. And he said, so, okay, flip on the uh, radio and call the police department, flip on the radio, call the ferry, flip on the radio, call the hospital, flip on the front alarm, flip on the back alarm and get on the radio and speak to the hospital. And I looked at the dashboard and it looked like a Jerry Lewis movie to me. It was just, you know, it was like, it was like a bad joke. And so I actually, it sounds funny, but I had to quit. I couldn't do it. I just wasn't capable. I just couldn't do the buttons. Plus this friend of mine did say, a mutual friend, you'll be the only guy driving an ambulance who says, hang on back there, I got to take a call. So that wasn't good either. But so, but I, you know, it sounds funny. I actually wanted to do it, so it didn't work out. But I, a friend of mine had started to volunteer at a place in New York called the Fortune Society, which um, helps people who've been incarcerated for short or in many cases, long periods of time. It started by this amazing guy named David Ruffenberg. And I went up to a meeting at their Harlem facility and found it amazing and, and, and high impact. So in the last year, I've been volunteering at the Fortune Society. Um, and it's quite a different little experience for me to spend just a few hours Queens, not at their residential facility with people who have spent a very, very long time in prison. And my role is to try to help them adapt and find their way in the work world. But, and I'm not sure I'm helping too much, but uh, in all seriousness, I'm not sure I'm helping them get jobs really. Um, I'm trying, but they're certainly helping me see the world a little differently. I mean it. And the woman who I work with, who's in charge of volunteers, said, you, you know, you are helping them just by hanging around, just by being here. So I've been doing, I've been doing that, which is different for me. Um, um, anyway, did anybody in the room? Yeah, please. <clears throat> oh, were you really? BAI. You just get a mic, I'm sorry, would you mind? Because I guess we're recording, forgive me. I was just listening to him this morning on WBAI. And when I came into the room, I asked Josh, you know, I heard you on an interview. You were interviewed by him. Really? Weren't you interviewed on, with your book? It's possible. You know, I, I actually, I've been going around talking about the book. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes and I'm actually not quite sure and it's funny to sort of tie things together. Your last movie with the black and white, the piano music was so beautiful. Was that uh, your husband's composition? No, sorry. No, that is Jacob Collier, who's a really well-known musician that um, my daughter, who's also a musician, had turned me on to. And I, when I was filming that, I, was, I turned my living room into a black box theater. <laughs> my husband was away at an art colony, so I had the whole place to myself. And I was dancing to his music and I really loved it. And I was like, oh, I really want to use this for this piece. And he's a big deal, but this was four years ago. And my daughter said, you know, hit him up. He's young, he probably. And so I emailed him, I didn't hear anything. And then I emailed him again, like two weeks <clears throat> later and he wrote back and he said, I would be honored. So I, <laughs> how nice is that? I have the rights <clears throat> to use the music, which is so nice. Yeah, that right. Actually, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. It's cool. He's it's a really interesting gorgeous. young musician. It's, yeah. and, and it's so fantastic because here we are talking with a film historian. Yeah. And this was the origins of film black and white with the piano player that moved everybody before they were talkies. And it's such a tragedy. All these films have been lost. They thought they were worthless and just tossed them. There's a lot of interest now on Buster. But WBAI.org, you can listen to it over your phone. I don't, I don't think you interviewed again. me. I think it's a different one. 
Uh, David I, I, Rothenberg, it's really great. It, oh, it, no, his show's great. Over 40 I'm, years he's been doing this that, work. Yeah. With four, and yeah. he was talking about some people there were originally there and just how an enlightenment of other uh, countries and how they their budget, I mean, it's, we think education is so expensive, try ignorance. But the other side of it is it's like f three or $400,000 a year to keep somebody on Rikers Island. Children for school books and other things. Yeah, he, by the way, is, and the Fortune Society is, uh, I couldn't do an adequate job of describing how, how big a deal it is. It's a big deal what he's built, David Rothenberg. And by the way, talk about careers, because I'm actually going to bring him to some place. And a third act. A third, by the way, do you mind telling he was a theatrical agent, right? Yes, he was with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. And yeah. he was there. Uh, just the great stories. He was a uh, World War II veteran, like uh, Ben Lear, and uh, a, a, a city kid, and yeah. uh, tragically lost his favorite uncle in World War II. That he was his hero, and no, it's it's he's a, he's really quite a citizen. Uh, fortune is not a little thing. It's really a big, high impact. Your book is such a great idea and so interesting. There's obviously, it's inspiring to people. I wonder if you'll end up doing another edition because there's probably so many people. You know, well, you know what, the, well, the fun of it, if I can be, you know, the fun of it is being here with you because, no, I'm quite serious because the people in the book are in the people in the book. And then, um, you know, the publisher said, well, you got to go around and talk about it. And of course, I'm happy to. And uh, it, it hadn't even occurred to me to bring other people into it. And the reason um, um, that David Rothenberg is on my mind is the public radio station in New York, WBAI, said, well, why don't you come and do a session here on this thing and on the broader subject, but make it New York-based because it's a New York public radio station. And so I thought, oh, gee, well, I should, there's only a few New York-based people. There's some wonderful ones, but I thought, why be limited to the book? So. <clears throat> because I'm volunteering there, I've never met him, but I emailed him and said, would you want to be on this panel? And they're, they're going to put it on TV and um, C-SPAN, hardly, uh, you, know, you know, but on their book programming. And so David Rothenberg agreed to come. And so I'm thrilled because he emailed me just yesterday and, uh, and said I'd be thrilled to uh, talk about it. So, so the, uh, sorry, the, I don't know if I do another book, but it's really nice to meet people not in the book who are um, are doing. Yeah, it's the beat goes on. You know, there's a stat written by the guy who did the forward, who's a true sort of gerontologist and expert. His name, he's written 18 books and he had three PBS specials. And in his forward, he says there's seven billion people on the planet and one billion who are 60 and over. So it's. There's a lot of humans who are living longer with some facility and capability. So it's, 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 it's this, the stories are abundant. You know, the stories are wild, man. Should we watch the clock, Steve, because we're approaching two? No? Just, just one other question. One other question. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I think it's great by not going to university or college, you learned what you couldn't do. I always looked about going to college and things like that, well, being inhibited, you know, oh, you can't do that. You can't. Right. No, it was funny because I did, I grew up, my, both my parents were professors at Dickinson College. <laughs> so I grew up as a college child, <laughs> but they were, you know, the ballet was so <laughs> present in our household. They were always supportive. You know, I was coming to New York as a child, so they knew and they, they were always very supportive. But when I was doing the transitioning for a second, I thought maybe, and then it just didn't ever feel like, you know, the thing for me. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> Somebody over here had a question. Well, the book. Yeah. So in case you didn't hear, a um, uh, nice woman asked, what was the criteria for the book? And so um, it was somewhat considered and a little bit random. The considerations were, I thought that it would be good to have some representation of people who are well-known that just to create accessibility. I come from the world of TV and film. So 
that's the standard way to go. So there's faces you recognize and names you recognize. And then there's 50 that you've probably never heard of. So which they are, um, they're not more interesting, um, but they're just unheard of. One doesn't know about uh, this guy, Jamal Joseph, who was a Black Panther in his youth in New York and spent time in prison, got two advanced degrees in prison, got out, taught at Columbia, and then started two theater groups that were uh, of high social impact. So who would know? You know, and there's a guy who uh, was a bankruptcy attorney and uh, um, see, he didn't just change, but he always was a lifeguard during the summer at Jones Beach. And there's a great story. And frankly, it's ripped off with acknowledgement from this American life. You take the lifeguard test, take the lifeguard test. I hope I get this right. And you have to pass it, of course. So it's in the mid in your mid 60s, it's a thing. But there's a requirement that he take it in a speedo. It's on this American life. And he said, no, I'm not taking it in a Speedo. And they said, you have to take it in a Speedo. He said, I'm not. And uh, so he sued uh, and he won. And yeah, I, I, but I hope I have this right because it was misrepresented somewhere and he understandably didn't like it, but he then took the test elsewhere and came back as a lifeguard uh, after, you know, I think you don't want to mess with a bankruptcy attorney when you're, saying you got to wear a Speedo. I guess if there's a life lesson, that was a life lesson. But there's just these wild stories. You know, I just, I get such a kick out of How it. How did you find like someone like that? Well, actually, the, that was an easy one because I heard it, literally heard it in real time on uh, oh, This American Life. Uh, there's a, a w young woman who's a friend of my daughter's and she's a school teacher. So I hired her to help me research and find curious stories. So just with greater facility than I might have combed the internet and surface stories. Um, so it was fun. And what I wanted to do, Patrick is a photography czar, you know, and I'm a dilettante and I wanted to find people with iPhones around the country to find the next Richard Avedon, Annie Leibovitz and send them in and find the next great undiscovered portrait photographers, but COVID hit and everybody was crazy about having a stranger in your house and all that stuff. So that didn't occur, but that would have been uh, a gift with purchase, gift with project, to have had, to have found people who just have a great eye to take pictures of people. Right, so if you didn't hear a question, she asked if the book <clears throat> will become a documentary or docu-series. You know, actually there have been two people who are documentary producers, because I know them, who said, let's make it a documentary. And um, I did ask them how they thought it would be constructed, not that I wouldn't want to do it. And they said, well, let me think about it because they're really good at it. They're very good at what they do. And they, they each confessed that they didn't have the right idea for how to bring it all together, that it could be a sort of TV series with each person, a vignette, but there wasn't, you know the business, there wasn't one narrative arc that carries you through all of it, you know, there happened to be individual documentaries on uh, on the well-known people, you know, on about eight of them, Gloria Steinem, Norman Lear, there are beautiful documentaries about them. So I have thought about it. Um, it'd be nice to get the right idea before doing it, which, you know, I hadn't thought of yet. It'd be the third act. Yeah, that's the shtick, you know, um, I'm just sort of thinking about whether there's a right, an idea worthy enough, you know, maybe Patrick Montgomery will come out of what he calls, quote, retirement, <laughs> since he did the complete Beatles and, fig and knows about archival footage and figure out the solution. I haven't heard it yet. And I haven't thought of it yet. It's not, actually, honestly, <laughs> my real reaction is it sounds like a lot of work. That, that's what I really didn't say is, oh, that's what I didn't say, which is it starts like fun and then you think whoa you know because um you know having been in the job i was in i became work averse with my own hands you know perfectly comfortable to delegate but not so happy to do that's meant to be sort of cute but not entirely yeah yeah you know some people just said i uh, i'm i'm engaging in my life for these 
purposes and I don't want any exposure. Others had different considerations about sort of vanity. In some individual instances, they're doing pro-social work. They're raising money and they didn't want the fundraisers to think that they were um, um, utilizing what they were doing for vain purposes. But there are others who saw it as an opportunity to advance their cause. Um, there's a guy named Paul Dillon uh, in here who is just a, quite a remarkable guy. Short story is he was in Vietnam, got out of Vietnam in 71, and he describes being horribly unwelcome when he came home because Vietnam was an unpopular war. And that veterans got, this is Paul talking, got mistreated, Vietnam 71. And so he became a consultant and he now has an incubator to set up companies to give seed money and expertise to veterans who are founding companies. Pretty cool. Does anyone in our audience at home have any questions? Feel free to type them in the chat if you would like. Yes, please. Probably almost everybody who considers a third act at one point alights on the idea of writing a book. Yeah. <laughs> like you. Um, and my question, again, very practical. How long does it take? Um, how hard is it to get a publisher? Do you need a publisher? And I guess, you know, you're a particular example because a lot of people want to do it. Yeah. And they start it and it's really hard and it takes a long time and nobody wants to publish it. Nobody yeah. wants to read it. Yep. Uh, you persevered through. Did were you able to do it because you're in the business somehow and maybe you <clears throat> self funded it? Like, yeah, is it a realistic yeah. pursuit? Sure, for regular people to sure, write sure. a book. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I can tell you what I what I understand, which is that um, uh, it, I got a small advance for it. Uh, it, it probably cost more to execute it than the advance covered uh, in terms of clearing rights. Um, and doing the research. Um, so presumably economically, if it sells, I can get royalties. It's selling for a coffee table book, okay. That's not tons. Um, you know, it, this book is, I guess, could be seen as quasi-commercial because, and, and in that there are many people who are turning that age. So it's not a personal novel. It's a little bit like an 11th grade homework assignment. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's not that elegant. There's the person, there's the several hundred words, there's the extraction of the quote. That's the book. You know, it's, that's not that complex. I like it, but it's not complex. So I think uh, I, did, I did an earlier book that was even more obscure that I got an advance for. And uh, I went around with the help of someone who knows the book world and we presented to publishers and I got a small advance for that one too. So I think it's possible, you know, um, to do the little I know of self-publishing, which sounds like a vanity. <clears throat> um, it's actually not, you know, it's, it's, it's quite now a robust business. I happen to have met the guy because he did a show with us um, who, I think this claim is accurate. Uh, there's a book called Wool that's done by a guy named Hugh Howey, and it's a monster book on, that's self-published. And he will not work with a publisher because he doesn't want to divide royalties. He does so well, and it's being turned into a, uh, a TV series at great expense. So I think both routes, as far as I know, are valid. I'm really not an expert in Subject, Patrick, you may know something about it. Do you have a mic? Find a microphone. Bypass publishers. The problem really is marketing. It's not about getting the book produced. How do you sell it? And things don't sell themselves on the internet. So you really have to be able to be adept at social media and be lucky enough maybe for something to go viral. The actual act of getting it published or getting it printed and on Amazon is not that hard, but getting attention is, is the hard part. 
you know, I would, I would amplify that and um, not to knock any publisher, they have their own economics and I'm working business, but I, what I have found is that I, um, I've worked on it for so long, <laughs> four years that I feel like it should be somehow seen by someone. So when I pass a bookstore, I go in and say, hey, you want to, and I don't carry the book. I just have a picture of it on my phone and say, you want to carry it. Curiously, most of them say yes. And then a lot of them say, you want to do an event here? And uh, so I think, you know, this is my event outfit. <laughs> uh, I have one sport coat in my closet and this sweater from Uniqlo. So event outfit. And so, um, so you, but you, you, I think it does require just what he said. You really do have to market it, which is just an anecdote. George Takai, uh, the guy who was Sulu, tweeted, he must have tweeted 18 words and the book, highest sales of the book ever in one day from one George Takai tweet because he has 3 million followers. That sort of thing. So if you could each go home and buy like a couple thousand copies on Amazon, uh, it'd be helpful. <laughs> or by the way, the local bookstore better um, was going to be here and it was, I failed to connect them. They were going to come and make them for sale. And of course I blew that. How's that for someone who's supposed to be in marketing? I, I blew the, I blew the moment, uh, you know, uh, they were supposed to come. And I think Steve knows the lovely people at the bookstore and they're very cooperative. So. So we should probably honor the clock and I assume some of you have things to do more purposeful than sitting in the basement with us. So I'm going to say to anyone who's not visible, thank you so much to all of you who are here. Thank you so very much to Margaret Garrett, the most beautiful art on the planet. And I'll just say that she does have a studio that um, I, I don't want to uh, offer it, but I'll just say that when friends come to visit me, I try and put Margaret on the, the tour of Shelter Island because it's the highlight. The boat ride's okay, but the Margaret Garrett art tour is a bigger highlight. And, it, and we actually have a lot of, a bunch of her stuff in our house. I'm not saying it without true conviction. It's just, they're just things of beauty, a uh, small and large, which I cherish. Um, and and uh, if I also may say, seem to embody her lightness of spirit so often. And that's, it makes it doubly nice. Thank you thank all you. so much. Thank, thank you, Thank you very much.